Hi everyone, welcome back. Do you remember that Disney movie from the 2000s about high school kids? No, not High School Musical. Do you remember that Disney movie from the 2000s about high school kids with special talents? No, not Camp Rock. Okay, do you remember that Disney movie from the 2000s about high school kids with special talents who were also complete outcasts and showed everybody that they were truly valuable by saving the day when they were least expected to? Wait, that's Minutemen too? Okay, it's Sky High. I'm talking about Sky High. That's right, today I'm talking about Sky High. Not a Disney Channel movie, but a theatrically released Walt Disney Pictures movie. Released about six months before High School Musical took high school movies into the stratosphere, Sky High was already up there because it's a movie about a high school that floats in the sky. I loved this movie when I was a kid, and while I don't remember whether or not I actually went to the cinema to watch it when it was released, I did have the DVD and I watched that so many times. And so today I decided to revisit Sky High to see if it really is that good all these years later. The movie follows Will Stronghold, the son of the two most famous superheroes in the world, the Commander and Jetstream, as he tries to navigate the toughest challenge a hero must face. High school. But not just any high school, as the movie centers around Will's incoming semester at Sky High, a school exclusively for superheroes. So the movie opens in the most standard way that any teen movie opens, with the main character getting ready for school, just as any normal teenager would, by already being fully dressed and lifting weights in his room. This would be the point in the video where, just like when I covered Camp Rock, I'd highlight all the interesting stuff in the, as always, intricately decorated, typical teenager bedroom. But there's only one thing I want to highlight this this time around, because I spotted that Will has a Weezer poster in his room, so at least we know he has taste. And the Get Up Kids too, and to be honest, I think the fact that both of them are in this 2005 kids movie probably says more about my music taste than it does about Will. So the big thing about Will is that, surprise surprise, he doesn't have any superpowers. And this is a secret that he's currently trying to hide from his parents, especially his dad who has huge expectations for him. And somehow in the last 14 years of Will's life, just hasn't figured it out yet. So way to be present, dad. I know that every kid thinks his dad's invincible and I nearly am, but who knows? Maybe the next time I punch a meteor hurtling toward Earth, I'll be the one who shatters into a million pieces. Right. Thanks, Dad. We then meet Will's mum and Layla, Will's childhood best friend whose superpower is controlling plants. Josie, it's the other one. Wait, you have another phone? Are you cheating on me? Then Will's parents rush off downtown to defeat a giant robot that we get to watch on the morning news on the most 2005 television ever. And finally, it's time to catch the bus to Sky High and we get introduced to our old friend, Beautiful Home Syndrome. But to be honest, I think out of all of the movies that I've mentioned it for, I think Beautiful Home Syndrome makes the most sense in this one. Because not only are Will's parents both the most successful superheroes on the planet, they're also pretty successful real estate agents. So, sky high, you get a pass on this one. So we next get introduced to Ron the bus driver, who, after finding out who Will's parents are, introduces him to everyone on the bus, sort of Harry Potter style. One of the very common, like, Disney kids movie tropes that I absolutely love in this movie is the way that each of the kids all have their own separate colour scheme that they wear for the entire movie. Not just in this opening scene, but throughout the movie they all have different outfits that will just like match their colour scheme. So like Layla is the green character because of her connection to nature. Will's other childhood friend Zack wears yellow. And Will's two new friends are Ethan, who's orange, and Magenta, who's actually kind of a darker purple. So something that I noticed at this point in the movie is that Sky High really loves the use of the Dutch angle. You know that thing where the camera angle's slightly tilted to show you that maybe something's up or something's wrong? So most people just use the Dutch angle every now and again, but Sky High likes to use it in every single scene. And it honestly makes the whole thing a bit difficult to watch. But hey, maybe the weird thing that's going on is just the whole movie. Morning. That's everyone. What was the point in that? Okay, so every night before work, does he like sew the patch back onto his arm? Or does he have like a wardrobe full of pre-sewn shirts that he selects just so he can like rip it off at the start? Hang on back there. We're going off road. Here we go! 
that's the movie, they all die. So the new freshmen arrive at Sky High, the floating school in the air for superheroes. And okay, I know I scrutinise these kids' movies way too much, but the bus driver Ron Wilson says that Sky High is in a secret location only known to a select few people like the bus drivers to keep it safe from villains. So why, not one minute later, are there some high schoolers that just fly in? Like, how are they allowed to know where it is? Oh, of course, because it wouldn't be a 2005 movie without some low-key sexual harassment. Hey, freshman! Your attention, please! I'm Lash. Uh, this is Speed. And as representatives of the Sky High Welcoming Committee, we'd be happy to collect that $15 new student fee. I love the way the bullies in all of these movies look like they're well into their late 20s. And they wear skulls on their shirts, so you know they're bad. And honestly, I spent a significant amount of this movie thinking that this guy and this guy were the same person. Or at least brothers or something. And I spent a lot of time expecting there to be this big reveal at the end that they were the same person, but no, they just look similar. And the last person to show up in this scene is Gwen Grayson. She's like the typical preppy girl that Will instantly has a crush on. But she's also a high school senior, so she's like three or four years older than 14 year old Will. And the movie just doesn't acknowledge that. Good morning, I am Principal Powers. On behalf of all the faculty and staff, welcome to Sky High. So did she change her name when she got the job? Or was the principal of the superhero high school always called Principal Powers? You're really sort of forced into that role there, aren't you? That's kind of like the principal of the school for the deaf being called Principal Can't Hear. Also, is this the entire freshman class? Like, there's 20 kids here. So, what, the entire school is like 80 kids in this massive building. But now it's time for the most important part of Will's day at Sky High, which is power placement, where each of the kids has to show off their superpower and they get sorted into either a hero or a sidekick class, depending on how impressive their power is. So here we have a bunch of new freshman kids, and you know, typically at this age, they're the most insecure and low confidence they'll ever be. So what's a way that we could welcome them into the school? Oh, I know. Let's separate them in front of all of their peers into the cool kids and the losers. This is the most messed up and hurtful talent show you could ever force on a bunch of insecure high school kids. But it's also the best scene in the movie. While some of these kids can turn into giant rock monsters or have acid spit, Will's friends can glow, turn into a puddle, and shapeshift into a guinea pig. So they all get sorted into sidekick, along with Layla who refuses to show her powers. The cafeteria staff requests Again, not to overanalyze Sky High lore, even though that's basically what I do on this channel, but they even feed the heroes and the sidekicks different lunches. Like, do they feed the sidekicks less than the heroes? Or just like, worse food? Okay, am I crazy or is that guy really looking at me? Dude. What? That's War and Peace. That's War and Peace? Yeah. I've heard about him. His mom's a hero and his dad's a supervillain. They're in battle. So where do I come in? Your dad busted his dad. Quadruple life sentence. No chance of parole until after his third life. Terrifying death stare aside, I just want to say that Warren Peace is genuinely the coolest name I've ever heard. Then after lunch, it's finally Will's turn at power placement, which is strange considering there's only 20 kids in the freshman year, so you would have thought they would have got to him already. But anyway. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know what your power is? <laughs> oh, I got it. You're messing with the coach. Just like your old man. Car. Oh, right. Attempted murder. So Will reveals that he actually doesn't have any powers, and so gets put in the sidekick class, and now has to break the news to his dad. Which, now that I'm thinking about it, actually isn't too bad. Considering I would have thought if you just didn't have any powers, you'd get kicked out of Sky High, and you have to just, like, go to a normal school. But it seems like... If you show up at Sky High and you don't have any powers, you just get to stay? Which doesn't really make any sense. Well, nothing seems to be broken. Except for me not having my powers. Well, maybe you're just a late bloomer. Oh! Oh! Dad, we need to talk. You mean little hero to hero talk? I think I know just the place. Go ahead, son. 
I already had your biometrics this morning. That's right, son. I already have your biometrics on file. I took them from you when you were sleeping. No way. You got a pool table? How about the pinball machine? The Secret Sanctum is just kind of a cool set piece from the movie. We get a look at a bunch of trophies that Will's parents have collected from the various missions that they've been on, including their most prized possession, the Pacifier, which is the weapon of their arch nemesis, Royal Pain, who they defeated many years ago. Now, what was it you wanted to tell me about? Oh, um... Well, you see, Dad, I don't actually have any powers, so everything you've shown me in this sanctum is completely worthless, and all of your hopes and dreams are pretty much shattered now. Dad, I'm gonna kick your butt in the pool. Oh yeah, that too. But Will ultimately keeps his secret from his dad for now and begins his sidekick classes. Sorry, his hero support classes, taught by his dad's former sidekick. Sorry, hero support. Yes. Yeah, um, when do we pick our names and costumes? Because I call dibs on Zack Attack. Well, you don't get the pick. On graduation day, you'll be assigned to your hero and then he or she will uh, decide what you will be called and what you will wear. I, I think this is mostly done in an attempt to avoid clashing colors. Doesn't the whole concept of you as a sidekick just being assigned to a hero who then dictates your every career move, giving you absolutely zero freedom for the rest of your adult life, sound a bit dystopian to you? Like, the more I think about it, the more it feels like the superhero world in this movie is a really terrible place to live. Will and his friends continue their sidekick classes, and they do go pretty well for a bit, until one day Will's dad gets home early. So if you kids are all in here, who's out there saving the world? Hey dad, uh, thanks for coming in and trying to impress my 14 year old friends with your skin tight costume. Kind of weird. But Will can't hold it off for any longer, so it's time for him to finally reveal the truth to his dad, which I'd say he takes pretty well. <laughs> You know, I think ideally this would be the moment where the movie just firmly decides that Will doesn't have any superpowers whatsoever, and then it could become a story about him being the world's first powerless superhero. But we can't do that because this is a kid's movie, and after all the kids do just want to see the character with his powers. So in the next scene, Will is forced into a fight with everyone's favourite Taylor Lautner stand-in, War and Peace, and just before his friends are about to literally die, he, surprise surprise, finally gets his powers. Really left it to the last minute, didn't you, Will? Couldn't have maybe done that yesterday? But Will finally getting his powers means that he has to leave his friends behind in the psychic class and move to the hero class with all of the cool kids, but not before he has to serve a detention for fighting in the cafeteria. I didn't do anything though, he started it. Your dad started it, and I'm gonna finish it. Don't bother. The detention room neutralizes all superpowers. Okay. But here's an idea. Maybe just make the cafeteria that room? So in Will's new class, he gets to sit next to none other than Gwen Grayson. You know, I can totally help you out with all this science stuff. Yeah, you do that? Mm hmm I could be like your private tutor. Ah yes, the high school senior with the 14 year old. Cool. <laughs> Save the Citizen seems like the absolute coolest game ever, but also really violent and really, really dangerous for a group of teenagers to be playing. Like, powers or not, just take a look at that and try and honestly tell me that no student has ever died playing Save the Citizen. Maybe this is why the school population is so small. Will and War and Peace team up to fight the two bullies and end up winning. And then PE just ends after that? So there's just a whole group of kids in the school that just didn't have to do PE? Maybe that's why they're so happy. Over the next little bit of the movie, Will is sucked more and more into the social circle of the hero slash popular kids as he becomes more and more distant from his friends, and importantly Layla, who he stands up one night after Gwen randomly shows up at his house. Your parents are great, Will. I'm so glad they're coming to homecoming. <sighs> now if I could only find someone to go with. You mean you don't have a date for homecoming? Well, I've gotten a few offers, but I turned them down. I'm just waiting for the right guy. Oh. You, Will. He is 14. 
And Gwen is 18. And just nobody is questioning this. So I thought that now might be a good time to bring up one of the many holes that I like to pick in this film, which I call the Harry Potter problem. So in Harry Potter, it's established that the entire school-aged wizarding population of the UK attends this one school. And in the fourth book, it's established that there are other schools like this across the world, but we're led to believe there's only one per country. And with a name as generic as Sky High, it's kind of insinuated that the same thing is going on here. So does that mean that the entire superhero population population of the United States lives in this one town. Did people have to like relocate from different parts of the country because this is the only place that they could get like a good superhero education for their kids? Who's protecting those other cities? Or are there just like loads of schools across the country that are all named Sky High? A whole thing then ensues where Layla and Will grow further and further apart with Layla trying to use Warren to make Will jealous and Gwen strengthening her grip on, again, a 14 year old boy. There's a problem with the homecoming decorations. Penny forgot to order the fog machine, so I might have to build one myself. Do you think the committee could stop by? Oh, I don't know, because my parents are on a distress call and they won't be home till late, and I'm really not supposed to have anyone here. Hey, it's cool. I was just hoping we could spend a little more time together. Look, I'll put it up on the screen for you. 14 years old. And of course, it wouldn't be a high school movie without the party scene. So does that guy have to stand there all night? Like, is he allowed to go anywhere? I love how the high school party contains absolutely zero alcohol, because after all, this is still a kid's movie. Hey Will, could you go get me a diet caffeine for your orange soda? Bro, Will's party was just crazy last night. I got so wasted on diet caffeine free orange soda. Oh! Hey. Sorry, just looking for a bucket. I wish there was somewhere we could go to be alone. Will takes Gwen into the forbidden secret sanctum, where their relationship becomes even more problematic. Then Layla shows up at the party, which leads to her and Will having a big falling out, and Will finally realising the error of his ways, dumping Gwen before the homecoming dance and kicking everyone out. And now it's the night of the homecoming dance, where even now all of the characters are still wearing their colour schemes, but just in formal wear, and Will makes a shocking discovery. That's weird. Gwen. Oh no. Oh no. So you're seriously trying to tell me that no one noticed this was the same person until right now? There's even a scene earlier in the movie where Gwen is going through the yearbook with Will's family and they point at that picture and just nobody catches it. Also, I've already been talking about how weird it is that Gwen is so much older than Will, but this just makes it so much worse. But yeah, at the homecoming dance, Gwen finally reveals that she is royal pain and takes everyone at the dance hostage with the help of all the other cool kids that were on the homecoming committee. Which makes sense, because after all, how else would Gwen be able to install these massive banners that say royal pain on them if the rest of the homecoming committee weren't in on it? Don't you think someone would notice? Oh. These things? They're just decoration. Don't worry about it. Royal Payne uses the pacifier that she stole from the secret sanctum to turn everyone into babies. Except for Warren and the sidekicks who managed to escape. And then Will and Ron Wilson show up. Will apologises to his friends and to Layla for treating them really badly. And then the group has to work together to figure out how to beat Royal Payne once and for all in the movie's big finale. When they're trying to save the school, each of the sidekicks discover that their superpower is actually really useful in the very specific scenario that's occurring right now. Which begs the question, if things were even slightly different, would they all not just die? In the big fight against Royal Pain, Will discovers that like his mother, he can also fly. And in the scene where Magenta uses her power to shapeshift into a guinea pig, there's some of the funniest special effects I've ever seen. <laughs> And finally, the group defeats Royal Payne and her goons once and for all, and the commander and Jetstream declare that the sidekicks were the real heroes all along. The villains get put in detention, instead of, you know, prison. And that's the end of Sky High. When I reviewed my notes for this video, that's right, I do actually write notes for these videos, 
I realized that this was basically just Harry Potter for superheroes. I know that's a very standard thing to say, but like, I think it really does work here. So hear me out. Like it's a secret school for kids with special abilities and there's only one of them in the country. And when they arrive, they get sorted into groups and there's special classes that you wouldn't get at a normal school. And there's a special sport that they play. And there's an existential threat to the school that only literal children can stop. I think the big problem that this movie's plot faces is that it chooses to resolve its biggest conflict, that being that Will doesn't have any powers, within like the first 20 minutes of the movie. And so then it has to pivot to this completely different story instead about Will abandoning his friends. And it's disappointing because I think there was a real opportunity with the premise to turn this into a movie about a superhero that doesn't have any powers. And then you could give him powers in the finale like they sort of do with the flying rather than just the generic high school plot that they chased after instead. But I think they probably chose to do it this way instead, because the target demographic for the movie would have probably been quite frustrated with the main character just not getting to use any powers. Also, the movie tries to make out that Will's being a huge jerk for abandoning his friends, but honestly it's not that bad. He's mostly just roped into it by Gwen and also the dystopian superhero education system, and most of the conflict with his friends are just really basic misunderstandings. So, I key tenet of story writing is that your main character shouldn't just be a person that the story is happening to, but rather they should be the person that's causing things to happen in the story. But in this movie, Will is a main character where things just happen to him. And so it makes the resolution kind of boring, because aside from realizing that in this one section of the movie he was being a jerk, he doesn't really have to go through any significant change. The biggest problem in the movie is not Will and his selfishness, but rather the system at Sky High that's separating kids into valuable and not valuable. And by the way, that doesn't change. This is the moral lesson that the movie's trying to teach, the idea that every human being has their own value that's distinct from one another, but the story itself doesn't actually follow that logic and it rather just brushes over it as a lesson to tack on to the end. The movie doesn't resolve by saying that the school got rid of sidekick and hero classes and everyone was considered a hero and they all worked together to find out what their strengths were. Rather, it just maintains the status quo. The sidekicks are still in sidekick classes, and future students are still going to have to be sorted into hero and sidekick in the power placement procedure. In fact, it's worse than all of this, because the sidekicks literally just get given a symbolic gesture, in that they get given the Hero of the Year award trophy, and then everybody's like, right, business as usual. And I can't shake the feeling that the message of this movie has accidentally become that instead of trying to fix an unjust system to make it better, you should keep the system the way that it is and just hope that something miraculous happens to you so that you personally don't have to deal with the system anymore. So this movie is just capitalist propaganda. <laughs> no, but joking aside, this movie's story definitely didn't go down the path that I hoped it would but it's still a fun movie regardless. When you strip away all the superhero elements, it is the most generic high school movie ever, but it's by applying those superhero elements to a standard high school movie formula that it becomes a fun movie to watch. I criticized it a lot because the structure of storytelling is just something that I personally find really interesting. But I do think that for what it is, it is a good movie. There's pretty much zero downtime in the entire movie, and I know that because aside from my first video, this is the longest script that I've ever written for a video on this channel. And it needed to be that because there's just so much to cover. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing me talk about Sky High as much as I enjoyed covering it. If there's something else you'd like me to cover, please let me know. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and I'll see you next time.